You know, some thought she was an overnight success when she swept the Grammys, but this guitar-toting songstress was actually two decades and 10 studio albums in the making. Without a doubt, it was a long and hard road to get there. I mean, she dropped by her label, written out by critics, and getting loaded after every show. It seemed like her career was over before it even started, after all that time. But her comeback was so sweet. And her legend was etched in stone when she covered a former football player's song that was so heart-wrenching, she sobbed through it. The song was inspired by something that a man said to a judge when he was being sentenced for shooting up his girlfriend's car. It's an amazing story. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Since Sal's all the time, make sure to subscribe below so you always get our latest content, the story straight from the legends. Make sure to check out our Patreon. We have a lot of great content going up there the next couple of weeks. So it's time for another edition of our show, number one in our hearts. This is the show that honors songs that were so unbelievably great. They deserve to be number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. But for multiple reasons, they came up short but they're usually better than the songs that were at number one during that time. Uh, now today we have an amazing story behind the heart-wrenching classic interpreted by many artists, but the first one was the best. It's I Can't Make You Love Me by Bonnie Raitt. Make you love me if you don't. Although she was the daughter of 1950s Broadway star John Raitt, Bonnie was raised on the country blues of Mississippi, Fred McDowell, and the Chicago blues of Muddy Waters. Get ready, you got to move. I want you to leave me, baby. So by the time Bonnie Ray started playing guitar at age 12, she already had the blues uh, in her blood. 1967, Ray entered Radcliffe College, but she dropped out after two years and she started to play the, the bar circuit. After Bonnie acquired the services of manager Dick Waterman, she began performing with her heroes, blues legends like Howlin' Wolf, Sippy Wallace, and Mississippi Fred McDowell. Her skill would earn her the reputation as one of the premier slide guitar players in popular music. Her reputation also led to a record contract with Warner Brothers, debuting in 1971 with an eponymously titled effort. Bonnie Raitt emerged as a critical favorite, applauded not only for her soulful vocals, but also for her guitar prowess. However, Bonnie Raitt's first real commercial success wouldn't come until 1977 with her cover of Del Shannon's Runaway. Right By the early 80s, it seemed like Raitt was primed to break out at any point. But instead, Raitt's career was in big trouble. Although 1982's Green Light reached number 38 on the Billboard 200, she still hadn't broken through to a wider audience. After Green Light, Bonnie got to work on her follow-up that was originally titled Tongue and Groove. On this album, Bonnie stretched out stylistically. She blended elements of reggae and ska into her rock and roll blues numbers. However, Warner Brothers, well, they hated it, and they pressured her to remix the album. And then the day after Bonnie finished, they actually dropped her from the roster. Bonnie Raitt was in complete shock. It was a devastating blow. You know, without an album support, Raitt had to cancel a national tour scheduled to start within just days. Said Bonnie about it, it was frustrating to say the least because even though I wasn't that happy with how they had promoted me for those 12 years, I still didn't want them to pull the plug right before my tour because that's how I make a living. But Bonnie hit the road anyway. She played acoustic sets in small clubs and supported herself from her savings. And to cope with this unexpected turn of events and to dull the pain, Bonnie was willing to try just about anything. You know, depressed, she amped up her social drinking and her hard partying lifestyle and also began eating excessively. Bonnie, who spent her career singing the blues, was now actually living them. At the age of 36, she felt like her life was passing her by. She'd even say, I didn't care because I must have felt I deserved how unhappy I was. Uh, explaining her drinking problems, she later said, I only got loaded after the gigs with a close circle of friends. I didn't want to get loaded in public. I cared about my career. I have too much pride to let people see me like that in public. 
but I did look bad. I put on about 40 pounds and it actually got to the point that someone once asked me when the baby was due, end of quote. Now, when Bonnie got a call from Prince, uh, who actually wanted to collaborate with her, seemed like just the break that she needed. Collaborating with the purple one, that could turn it all around. And in a way it did, even though the partnership never really amounted to much. She knew that if they were successful, they'd probably do a video together. And that thought was enough to make her want to make a change. I mean, Prince, after all, was a slimmed down sex symbol. And she didn't relish the thought of playing opposite of him in the music video. Knowing that there was a relationship between drinking too much and being heavy, uh, Ray took a long look in the mirror and decided to get off the path of self-destruction. It was time to, to lose the weight and to give up the bottle entirely. Bonnie's transformation was dramatic. I mean, she got a bike, she went on a diet, and she even joined Alcoholics Anonymous. Within about two weeks of starting AA, Ray already felt like a totally different person. She lost the weight, she quit the drugs and the alcohol, and in the process, she actually found herself. By 1988, Bonnie was eager to record again and connected with her friend Joe Smith at Capitol Records. Smith thought that she deserved a chance, and Capitol took her on. It proved to be a great decision. So with the help of producer Don Waz, uh, Rate released her breakthrough album, Nick of Time. This was in 1989. The record smoothed out some of her rough, bluesy edges without being overly commercial. It included two adult contemporary top 10 tracks. Have a Heart, oh, such a great song. Have a heart, and the heartbreaking ballad, Nick of Time. As we further break down this video, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know what? Go download the new Zenny app on your phone. It's amazing. You can pick all of your styles there, order. It's very easy. Zenny.com or Zenny the app. You can make your heart feel By the end of the year, Nick of Time was the best-selling album of Raid's career and has since sold over 5 million copies in the United States alone. Ray was also nominated for four Grammy Awards. She came home with a clean sweep, a feat that caught everybody off guard, including herself. I mean, she took home Album of the Year, beating out Tom Petty, Fine Young Cannibals, Traveling Wilburys, and Don Hanley. I don't think anyone would have predicted that. As perfect as that night was, what followed was even more amazing. After two decades in the record business, Bonnie Raitt was an overnight sensation. Said Bonnie about it, I knew it was going to be a life-changing event just to win one Grammy, but to win three more in the same night, it just catapulted me into the stratosphere. I think the combination of not being a household name and winning four Grammys on the same night that landed her on the front page of the papers, and it was really like winning the lottery. And yet there were still bigger things to come. I mean, including her, her most heart-wrenching song, maybe even her best song ever. Around the same time, Ray's personal life also stabilized when she married Irish actor and poet Michael O'Keefe. And after years of singing about broken hearts and faithless lovers, Ray was a woman on top of the world. And her next album, 1991's Luck of the Draw, would further prove it. The record was an immediate smash. It went on to sell even more copies than Nick of Time, 7 million in the U.S. alone. And once again, she would take home another four Grammys. In interviews talking about Luck of the Draw, Bonnie said, I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to come up with something deep enough for people to compare with the song Nick of Time. But I knew that set a standard and I didn't want to wimp out. So Ray dug deep to expose some of her more personal emotions, and the results were refreshingly honest on pop radio. Luck of the Draw would release six singles, five of which would break the top 20 on the USAC charts.
and the lead single, Something to Talk About. That went to number five on the Hot 100. But perhaps the song that would leave the longest lasting impact, a total standard, was Rate's emotional and painfully real ballad in today's featured song, I Can't Make You Love Me. These final hours, I, will lay down. I mean, it's number one in our hearts, but it's also a new standard, if there ever was one. I Can't Make You Love Me is a sorrow-filled heartbreaker in the best kind of way. And although masterfully performed by Bonnie, it was actually written by the Nashville songwriting team of Mike Reed and Alan Shamlin. And Mike Reed, in a previous life, was an all-pro NFL player for the Cincinnati Bengals. He got the idea for the song from a newspaper article. Apparently, some guy uh, who got drunk and shot up his girlfriend's car. And when the judge sentenced him, and he asked him what he had learned, this guy said, you can't make a woman love you if she don't. As soon as he read that line, it was fluid. He knew that line had to be a song. I Can't Make You Love Me would be rewritten many times before it was finished. And originally the song was a fast, it was a bluegrass number. But after slowing down the tempo, they realized the song gained considerable power. We wrote most every week in Mike's basement, said Shamlin. And we worked on this song for more than six months. One day he said, come up to the living room where his piano was. And he sat down and he started playing this melody. It was one of the most moving pieces of music I'd ever heard. I mean, it hit me in a hard way. Instantly, I knew it was the best thing I'd ever been a part of. End of quote. Now, when Reed and Shamlin completed the demo, they thought it would be a good fit for Linda Ronstadt. Bette Miller was also rumored to be considered in the mix. But uh, Mike Reed had worked with Bonnie Raitt before on Nick of Times Too Soon to Tell, and he opted to send it to her instead. Wise choice. To Bonnie got it. She listened to it. She loved it. She loved it on first listen. She said it was absolutely one of the most honest and original heartache songs I had ever heard. It was a point of view that I had been on both sides of, and it struck me deeply. I knew immediately that I wanted to sing it. Uh, knowing that this song was very, very special, she recruited Bruce Hornsby to play on it. And she credits his musical and soulful contributions for the song's hit status. Of course, uh, Bruce Hornsby, no stranger to hits himself. That's just the way it is. Now, I want to take a second and talk about this for a second. Bruce Hornsby is one of my favorite artists ever. I love all of his music. I've got every album he's ever done. He's overdue for a show on here. So call me biased, but the reason that no one will ever top Bonnie Raitt's version of I Can't Make You Love Me, well, it's twofold. Number one, of course, Bonnie Raitt's heart-wrenching, honest interpretation of this song, and Bruce Hornsby's achingly beautiful playing at the end of the song. I mean, many have covered this song, Adele, George Michael, Prince, on and on and on, but nobody will ever top it. It's one of the most covered songs of the last few decades. No one will come within a country mile of their version because really, even though Bonnie didn't write the lyrics or the music to the song, she encompassed it. She wrote it with her voice. Very few have touched the aching heart center of rejection and sadness of this song. I mean, I'm talking Frank Sinatra, I'm talking Joni Mitchell level here. And one more for the road That clouds from both sides now And I feel the power but you Truth is, she walked into the studio and sang it one time. Just one time. That's the record. She later said that the song was so sad that she couldn't recapture the emotion. She said, we tried to do it again and again. And I just said, this, this ain't going to happen. According to her producer, Don Waz, Bonnie only chose songs that directly pertain to her life. No, you won't, I can't he would say her music is very personal. 
She's not acting. She doesn't need enhancing. And that's how he approached his production duties with Bonnie Raitt. His job was to protect her musical authenticity and not to reinvent her performance. In fact, Don said he felt like he was witnessing greatness as Bonnie recorded. How could you not? We knew this was a great song. You know, we had Bruce Hornsby in there playing piano with her, but when she connected to this thing, I don't even know how to describe it. Uh, but I guess it's like someone hooking you up to an electrical current. It was a physical experience to sit there and listen to it as it was going down there in the studio. Jeez, that was incredibly emotional. Going back to that one vocal take for a second, though, uh, the only thing Don was would change was a couple of lines where Bonnie started sobbing as she was singing him. She was so emotionally connected with her performance that she couldn't get through it without just breaking down. I close my eyes. Gosh, Bonnie Ray said that she just kept crying, especially when she got to the lines, I'll close my eyes, then I won't see the love you don't feel when you're holding me. Then I won't see the love they were the saddest lyrics she had ever heard, even for Waz, who couldn't personally relate to it. He said, I can't make you love me. It's tough for him to listen to without getting emotional. He credits that to the, the rawness of Bonnie Raitt's performance. When you're holding me. Look, I think every one of us, within the sound of my voice, every one of us has had this experience at one time or another. I mean, I've been on both sides of it. and. Although I do normally elaborate on my own personal stories, I gotta tell you, it's just too painful to recount. All I can say is I thank God every day that this song didn't come to pass when I met my now wife. Will come. I remember when I met my wife for the first time, I thought if this woman doesn't feel the same way I feel about her, I just won't be able to bear it. If you haven't listened to I Can't Make You Love Me lately or ever before, you got to listen to it. But the song itself is about a woman who knows her man has fallen out of love with her. Or maybe he's just was never in love with her. But she wants to spend one more night with him before she moves on with her life. Instead of lying to herself, you know, she confronts this, this heartbreaking reality and looks for closure in this final night together. I can't make you love me. It's a powerful song. It's about begging to be loved when you know it's not going to happen. It's somber, it's engrossing, and I can't really be listened to more than once in a month. For me, it's just too hard to take. And I'll do what right. just give me Bonnie Raitt would really put it in perspective when she said, of all the songs in my career, that one is the greatest gift. I think it stands among the best songs I've ever written. I have to agree. I mean, the depth of the pain conveyed is so real. And because of that, singing it is a sacred moment that she gets to share with her audiences. Then, to give up this fight. And then the video for I Can't Make You Love Me, oh, so atmospheric. It uses the shorter single version of the song. It's filmed in black and white with vibrant lighting effects. It features Bonnie performing the song in front of a curtain with a silhouette of the great Bruce Hornsby playing the piano in the background. Oh, just the way he captures that. The mood of the video, it's just a perfect fit for the song. I can't make you love me. Criminally, I Can't Make You Love Me only reached number 18 on the Billboard Hot 100. I just don't understand it. It should have been a number one hit easy. Now on the AC charts, it did make it all the way to number six. But then internationally, it struggled as well. It stalled at number 77 in Australia, it went to number 50 in UK, went to 43 in the Netherlands, 40 in Canada, and it went to number 22 in New Zealand. But I guess that's why we do this show. I mean, to honor these masterful songs that just didn't get their due on the charts. If you don't, you can't but all these years later, it's huge. Huge, this song has been so covered. Also in pop culture, it's appeared in a few movies and TV shows, CSI in 2011, Blood Brother in 2013, and Duchess in 2020. Again, it's been covered by so many artists, Aretha Franklin, Prince, George Michael. Kenny Rogers.
Rogers, Neil Sean, Bonnie Tyler, Carrie Underwood, Patti LaBelle, Boys to Men. Okay, that was very good. Melissa Etheridge, Kelly Clarkson, Bruce Hornsby. Panic of the Disco, and of course Adele had her version a few years ago. If you don't feel something that it won't. Rate's next album after Luck of the Draw was 1994's Longing in Their Hearts. This one spawned more US hits and achieved two million sales. The song Love Sneaking Up on You led the way that came in at number 19 of the Hot 100 and it went to number two on the AC charts. Seems like she always had better luck on the AC charts, I guess. Then in 95, Rate did a cover of Roy Orbison's You Got It for the movie Boys on the Side. That came in at number 33 on the Hot 100, and it went to number six on the AC charts. And then she resurfaced in 1998, with the fundamental that scored a number one adult alternative airplay hit with One Belief Away. And then in 2000, Bonnie Raitt was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame deservedly, where she performed none other than I Can't Make You Love Me. More albums would follow, Silver Lining in 2002, and then Souls Alike in 2005. Afterward, Rate would step back from her life as a professional musician to deal with the passing of her parents, her brother, and her best friend. In 2012, Bonnie would release her first studio album in seven years. It's called Slipstream. Uh, the album debuted at number six on the Billboard 200, and it took home the 2013 Grammy Award for Best Americana Album. Who used to rule the world? In February 2016, Rate issued Dig In Deep, and then just recently in 2022, Rate released Just Like That. You know, in my opinion, Bonnie Rate is the epitome of rock and soul. It took a long time for the, the world to recognize her legendary artistry, but it was always there. And it's etched in stone with I Can't Make You Love Me. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Bonnie Raitt and I Can't Make You Love Me. What are your memories of the song? <laughs> this is one of the most heart-wrenching songs of all time. What do you think? What are some other heart-wrenching songs out there? Let's have a great discussion about this. The great voices that bring these, these uh, masterpieces to life. Uh, make sure to subscribe below if you like this video so that you're always in the know. And uh, check us out on Patreon. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.